Hoda agrees, does the same thing. Tardio then does it again. And this is what he said. I mean, this is what apparently this means. It means that there were a series of energetic and distinct events which began high and went down low rapidly and at regular intervals. There's nothing vague about that. That is extremely distinctive. And this is what they say. Soda, floor by floor, it started popping out. Tardio. It was as if they had detonated. Detonated. You know, as if they were planted to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. Soda. Yeah. Nothing vague. This is rich testimony. It deserves to be pondered. It cannot be easily dismissed. Now, I want to take that hand gesture as a symbol of what it means to look for corroborating testimony. And that's why when we go on to our second rich case, we're now talking about quality testimony. I want to take Paul Lamosa. You also saw this clip yesterday, but again, we're going to pause on it a bit. This man uh, was helping to uh, do a commercial near the World Trade Center on 9-11. He was building a set. And his testimony is very specific and detailed. And he also gets very moved. If you watch the whole thing, he begins to cry. He was, he was in the thick of things. And here is a brief clip from what he says. This is very good eyewitness testimony. This, as far as I can tell, this footage is entirely independent from the Nade Brothers film. That means this gentleman, Paul Amos, did not see the, the uh, firefighters and they did not see him. And here they are independently on the day itself, and we know it's the day itself. We can see Building 7 in the background during Paul Amos' testimony. The same gesture. Boom, 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 boom. Here's what he says. And by the way, this man doesn't guard himself. The firefighters don't go so far as to say they were explosions. They just say they looked like them. He doesn't guard himself. Here's his gestures. Here's his words. All of a sudden, I looked up, and about 20 stories below the fire, I saw from the corner, he's talking about the North Tower, the same building that the two firefighters were talking about. I saw from the corner. Boom, 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 just like 20 straight hits. Just went down. And then I just saw the whole building just went And as the bombs were going, people just started running. And I sat there and watched a few of them explode. And then I just turned around and I just started running for my life because at that point the World Trade Center was coming right down. Very rich testimony. And I'm going to pause for a moment to say something else about it. If you watch the whole interview, he says at one point, he makes a remarkable statement at one point, that while he was there, after he watched the building come down, they, meaning the authorities presumably, pulled in an architect who came up to Mr. Lemos and told him that he had not perceived explosions. He had not perceived explosions. They told me they weren't explosions. And then he, he talks about his interaction with the architect. The architect asks him, what did you see? And that's when he goes through the whole thing all over again. And, and the architect says to him, how fast were they? And he says, like firecrackers. Now, there's no evidence that Paul Lemos was ready to give up what he believed he thought he saw. But already on 9-11, on the scene, he's being told what he didn't perceive. Uh, now, all... I'm not going to suggest that uh, the uh, architect was there for a sinister purpose. 
although I suspect he was. <laughs> but this much at least we can say. There is no way at that point that anyone could have claimed to know scientifically that this man had not perceived explosions. Hadn't studied the rubble, the re physical residue, hadn't done a comprehensive study of video or still footage, hadn't done a comprehensive investigation of eyewitness. Said, How on earth could he make that judgment? But there's more. He's interfering with the criminal investigation. I don't care whether you look at this as a homicide investigation or a fire investigation or a bombing investigation. In all three cases, it's clear that eyewitness testimony is important and that you go to the scene and you gather it. You don't tell eyewitnesses what they did and didn't perceive. He's interfering with the investigation. And one of the reasons this is so important is because as I read through the firefighters' oral histories, I could see that in the months, they were collected mainly from about October 2001 to January 2002, and that over those months, some of them are beginning to retreat from their statements. Well, maybe I didn't see that. And during that whole period, they are being bombarded, largely through the mass media, with the structural failure hypothesis. And more specifically, the so-called pancake theory, according to which the towers came down because of pancaking floors. Now that theory was ultimately given up by NIST. So it's sad when you see these people doubting their own senses in favor of a hypothesis which is thoroughly discredited now. But I wanted to give you one or two examples. Uh, this may seem like a tangent, but I don't think it is. I think figuring out why people sometimes backed off their, their eyewitness statements is quite important. So three quick examples from the firefighter's testimony. Dominic DeRubio, speaking of the South Tower. It was weird how it started to come down. It looked like it was a timed explosion. But I guess it was just the floor starting to pancake one top of the other. That's what he was told, not what he saw. James Drury. We started to hear the second roar. That was the North Tower now coming down. I should say that people in the street, myself included, thought that the roar was so loud that bombs were going off inside the building. Obviously, we were later proved wrong. And finally, John Coyle, firefighter, talking about the South Tower, and he begins in this rather pathetically tentative way. The tower was, it looked to me, I thought it was exploding, actually. That's what I thought for hours afterwards. Everybody, I think, at that point, still thought these things were blown up. Everybody? It's a remarkable statement. Okay, so uh, we've seen two uh, examples of what I call quality testimony. And I want to give you a third now. And the third one is meant to answer a specific objection. Remember the various ways of dismissing this testimony that I mentioned? One of them is to say, well, those sounds could have been anything. How do you know they were explosions? They could have been columns breaking. They could have been elevators crashing, bodies hitting the ground. And a number of other examples are given. A couple of, uh, I guess, three gentlemen one of whom, at least, is a very prestigious scholar, published an article a couple of years ago suggesting that the booms were sonic booms from ejections coming from the uh, towers as they came down. I'd be happy to discuss that theory with you later. It's grotesquely unempirical. In any case, I thought it would be good if we could find quality testimony. I shouldn't call it testimony if it hasn't been given under oath. Quality eyewitness statements which would be difficult to explain as anything but an explosion. And so I, I chose uh, Port Authority Police Officer Sue Keene and her testimony. And I can tell you more later, if you like, about the sources. This particular, sorry, uh, eyewitness statements are from a book called Women at Ground Zero. And she gave this uh, 